I'm a real world Challenger business jet captain and former airline pilot. Any procedures or techniques I discuss with you today are strictly for flight simulator use only and for our entertainment. Always consult a professional flight instructor for flying lessons. Well, as you can see, we made it onto the ground here at Miramar, California, Marine Corps Air Station, Miramar. And you can see the aircraft is set up for, or well, we're getting ready for a departure. So the day that we arrived, we were on the, um, on the approach and we were put into a hold by air traffic control due to congestion at Marine Corps Air Station, Miramar. And during our hold, we decided to get our approach checks done. So approach checks are normally done at 10,000 feet minimum. And if you can recall, our approach checks would be APU start. Once we've got it started and stabilized, APU gen would come on. Landing a logo lights is required. Thrust reversers armed. Passenger signs on. Passenger briefing completed. Cabin secure. Tent stage bleed transition about two minutes after you get your APU running in order to allow for temperature stabilization. And then the ATS is moved to take off power. So those are the approach checks completed. But on this day, unfortunately, when we started our APU, we got an APU overspeed, as you can see right here. With the APU overspeed, we're unable to use the APU and therefore we're unable to switch over our tent stage bleeds to the APU. Therefore, the pressurization remains with the aircraft. With this condition, there are some things you really need to think about as a captain. As you're coming down into weather, if you have the aircraft bleed system using anti-ice uh, for the wings and the cowls, you may have an issue with getting your perf set up in your FMS. So what am I talking about? If we head into the aircraft here now. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go into our perf page and I'm going to select perf, gain, approach. Make sure I'm in the airport that I'm arriving at here. Set in your winds, all of that information, your runway conditions, and then head over to page two. So this one here is where we look at engine bleed. Now, the APU is not providing any help for us today. So what we need to do is switch this over to tent stage bleed. Now, here's the issue. If I go all the way over to wing and cowl operation, I may have an issue with my go around portion of uh, my, perf, my perf. So if I go here, I can look at my approach climb and landing climb. So approach climb is maybe something we've never talked about possibly. This is the single engine requirement. If I, if I lose an engine, this is the approach climb gradient that I'm able to maintain. This is pretty darn good, but uh, this is two engine, this is single engine. So it's just something you'd be concerned about is that you may not meet your approach climb or your missed approach climb gradient if you have tent stage bleed transitioned uh, or not transitioned over to the APU. So that's just something I wanted you to be aware of. Now, as we get the aircraft ready on the ground here and we head outside, now we're gonna talk about getting this aircraft from Miramar over to Tucson. We're going to head over to Tucson because it's a center where Bombardier is located. We can get our APU looked after and we don't have to fly technicians in from all the way from Canada because we need the aircraft the next day. So we're going to get this airplane fired up and head over to Tucson, KTUS, and uh, follow all the procedures. See you there. Okay, well, our aircraft is outside. It's chalked. We have AC power on. Why would we want AC power? Well, first of all, we're not getting any power from our APU, as you know. So we cannot complete all of our required tasks as far as FMS setup and all the things that we need to do unless we have AC power because we would basically have our batteries would be dead. So we have our AC power unit going and that's really great. And we also have an air start cart ready to go some things that are really really important to consider as far as safety one of those being is where you want to position the aircraft in order to accomplish this start in order to accomplish what we're planning on doing here we're going to start engine number two using the 
air start equipment that we have. Then what we're going to do is we're going to have our first officer don some hearing protection, exit the aircraft, complete a walk around of the entire aircraft very slowly and methodically and make sure that the AC cart has been removed. And I want you to think about what I just said there. If I remove the AC cart, what do I absolutely remember, need to remember to do? Uh, yes, I have to remember to engage my generator number two. Now, if you look at all the start procedures that you may be able to find, nothing's going to tell you to do that. So make sure that you've got engine number two started using the AC power cart, which we're going to go through in depth here. But I just want you to remember, there's a lot of things that are not normal here. And when things are not normal, well, things can go sideways. So let's make sure we do things as safe as possible. We're going to start up engine number two using the air start. Once that's completed, we have generator number two online and everything is good to go. We're going to call for the air start cart to be removed and the AC cart to be removed. Then we will send one of our personnel outside the aircraft, complete a complete walk around very carefully, making sure that all the panels are closed. Everybody is clear around the aircraft. Now, why is that so important? Because what we're going to do next is we're going to do a cross bleed start. So what we're going to do is we're going to start this engine using this engine's bleed air. Now, in order to do this in real life, we are going to have to create a whole bunch of noise and a whole bunch of jet blast behind us. So in real life, this is a fairly dangerous thing to do. Not necessarily dangerous, but hazardous. And we need to be aware of things like this back here. <laughs> um, if you can imagine these are another aircraft back here, you're on a busy ramp and you're just trying to, you know, get the heck out of Dodge, if you will, and head over to somewhere else. You may not think about this. Cross blade start. Remember, these engines develop 9,000 pounds of thrust at full thrust there, give or take. Now we're going to be using a lot of it. We're going to be using almost 60% of that thrust. And now in order to do that, we're going to create a whole bunch of abnormalities we're going to have to really ride the brakes we're going to have to make sure that the aircraft isn't moving we want to sure ensure nobody is around the aircraft now in real life this procedure that we're doing it is hazardous one because the equipment that we have around us all those other things but generally this isn't done a lot when's the last time you saw a challenger 650 doing a cross bleed start Probably never. Um, it, it does happen though. So we have to be very, very aware of our safety issues. So let's say you come to an airport and you have managed to secure an air start cart, but you could not get an operating AC cart. Is it possible? Can you do a, um, a, a air assisted start without a AC cart and only on batteries? Yes, you can. But the issue that you're going to have, and we'll just head right into the flight deck here. If we go to our summary page here and we look at our bleed pressure that we have here, this is what we're going to talk about here when we do the start here in just a few minutes. We will not have this indication. Bleed pressure will not be read. You have no idea how much pressure is going to be putting out from that system. You have to rely on the ground crew knowing that they know the system. So knowing that if we do a battery start only, you will not have bleed pressure. You have to know that the ground crew knows what they're doing, that the, the system is capable of um, accomplishing the start without damaging your $30 million aircraft. Probably one of the more frustrating things that you're having to deal with with the Challenger 650 is the lack of documentation. And I really feel for you. I. I uh, have been asked many, many times to provide documentation to people, and unfortunately, I'm unable to do that through contractual obligations. What I will tell you, though, this procedure that we're about to do under engine starting, which is located in normal procedures, engine starting in the Challenger 650 crew operating manual, I can tell you that this is, um, well, this is a very long procedure. 
and it's long because there's a whole bunch of steps that have to be followed. The first one is uh, engine start procedure with an APU. It's the one that you've done over and over and over. The one we are going to do today though is called engine start procedure external air also known as an AC power cart or sorry also known as an air cart or a huffer cart external air with AC power so that's going to be our first procedure that we're going to follow here today now if again if we did not have that we could do the next procedure which is engine start procedure battery and external air so battery only that's where it's going to give you all those caution messages about not having uh, indications and that kind of thing and the next one which we're going to accomplish after we get engine 2 started is the engine start procedure cross bleed so we're going to accomplish the very first one here right away starting with the checklist we have completed a walk around of the aircraft um, the AC power cart is on, it is providing power. We have got uh, most of our systems up and going here and we are ready to complete our start. And the ground crew has been fully briefed on all emergency procedures. As you can see, we're located in the far, far corner of the airport here and we have no dangers behind us and everything has been tied down appropriately. So now we're going to go to the, we have completed our before start check and we are at engine start procedure, external air with AC power. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the engine start procedure, external air with AC power. And I'll go through this as slow as possible so you can kind of follow along. So we'll head up to the overhead panel. First thing it says, bleed air APU LCV switch light press out so we'll just make sure it is so APU LCV switch light there's in there's out pressing out to close the load control valve check APU LCV open light is out so there is no light on external air connected verify 45 psi minimum bleed air pressure on the ICAS so now we know that the air start unit is ready to go. Um, what we're gonna do in the simulator, however, is we'll go to ground services, air start unit. Air start unit is connected, and we, we know that it physically is connected, and the engine is running. Um, in real life, it's extremely loud, it's a jet engine. And uh, we have different modes that we can select. We have normal, start, and packs, the ones what I really am aware of is I can use air start air with the packs in order to cool the aircraft while we're on the ground. And so that is something that can be done. It's not something we like to do. It tends to be kind of an oily smell that's coming into the aircraft because of the um you know the 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 air source that we're getting it from the air start unit. And then also the start mode, which is what we're going to want to request. So I've got that on there. I've already commanded the uh, air start bleed valve to be opened. So at this point in real life, there would be a whole bunch of sound that's on. There'd be pressure on the manifold. Um, for some reason, it doesn't seem to happen that way um, with our system here, but that that's okay. Uh, we are ready for our start essentially. So um, at this point, I have already given the command for the engine start of number two. I've received an okay from the uh, the person outside. It's gonna get extremely loud. The air start unit's gonna be running. The other engine, number two, is gonna be running. And eventually, you know, we're gonna head outside and do all the checks that we've talked about. Okay, continuing on here. Um, Verify 45 PSI minimum bleed air pressure on the ICAS. We're going to do that in just a second. The note here is the external air source must be capable of supplying 45 PSI manifold pressure at the initiation of start. However, lower pressure units dependent upon altitude and flow have been proven satisfactory. So those are the key things. Next thing is uh, we're gonna press the engine start switch light and go on from there. Couple things you'd like to note for yourself. Let's turn these boost pumps on. That's not mentioned in the checklist. So we wanna get those on. 
Uh, well, let's just have a real quick, we got external power going. This is going to come on afterwards. Um, to be honest with you, these would be on right now. Uh, we've got our beacon on. We set this for departure and everything else I think is all in the condition that I want it to be in at this point. We'll get a start happening here. So it says right engine start light press to start applicable engine. Press the start light. Con confirm that the start light comes on. Ignition A or B comes on. The ignition A, B advisory comes on in the ICAS and checks that there's positive bleed air pressure. Again, we need 45 PSI. Check that N1 increases. Then we're going to do our normal start procedure. We're going to lift our right thrust lever to idle. It says for ITT greater than 120 degrees prior to start, engine must be moved, engine must be dry motored to lower ITT to below 120 degrees Celsius before moving thrust lever to idle. The starter cranking limit of 90 seconds for first attempt must be adhered to. So normally, we're going to follow the procedure. Starter engages at 55%. The ignition is going to go out. We want to make sure the ITT is between 450 and 600, maximum 900 for the start. N1 stabilizes and does not go below 22%. And check that oil pressure is within the normal range of 25 PSI, above 25 PSI. Okay, with that, no further, uh, we'll go with ignition B on. We've got all of our signals made. We're going to hit our start, press and hold it. You can hear the air starter coming up there. Let's return back down here now. Uh, we've got... Uh, I'm just going to bring this up here. This is a little awkward. Summary page. We got our pressure that we want. We've got N2 above 20% and below 120. Positive fan. Here comes the fuel. Okay, fuel flow. ITT. Oil pressure. Everything is looking really good. Our hands obviously going to be on here. We're looking for 55% starter cutout. coming up okay 55% let's look up here starter is cut out and you can hear the air start units coming back down we're gonna proceed over to here fuel system check valve operation head up to top here both fuel pumps are gonna come off we are looking for the door is normal it's it, it's concerned that we have the door open and we're going to start an engine. We know it's we need it open. So we've got the right fuel pump and the left fuel pump, and we have the left low fuel pressure. That's what we want. Um, just reading on here, it says right or fuel left and right boost pump switch lights press out to turn both fuel pumps off. To turn both boost pumps off, check the following. Left and right boost pump on, lights out. Left and right boost pump in up, lights on. Left and right fuel pump advisory message is out. Fuel low pressure caution message is enunciated for the non-operating engine. So we've seen that, but there's caution messages here. After two minutes, if fuel low pressure caution message is still not displayed for the non-operating engine, dry motor the engine accomplish for maximum of 30 seconds of the non started engine so the left engine applicable fuel low pressure caution message should be displayed during motoring as the residual fuel pressure is reduced now a great big caution message here caution an absence of fuel low press caution message during the check is an indication that the fuel feed cross flow check valve may have failed in the open position or that another component of the engine fuel feed system may not be functioning properly the fuel system needs to be further troubleshooted so we've seen all of that and we do have a stable start we've got two um if we go with our two four six we've got two roughly four 
we have six and then also a four. So that's a nice, good, stable start on that side. Now we want to get that number two generator online. There we go. Number two is coming on. That looks really good to me. Now we're going to give the signal to remove the air start cart and to remove the external air or external AC cart. So first thing I'm going to do is make sure we've got power generators connected, remove the external power source. You can see that that has been disconnected there now. I'll go up to the over top here or up, up into our, our menus. I'll remove the external AC generator. I'm going to also remove the air start unit. I probably don't have to do all these things here. I'll just go that. We'll see if it takes it away. Okay, it is, it is now hopefully gone. So now what we're going to do is, as we mentioned, um, the captain's going to remain in the seat. The other person's going to put their hearing protection on. And we're going to head outside the aircraft. But we'll just pretend that the captain's doing it. Okay, so we're going to head out. Obviously, it's going to be extremely loud outside here. Have a look back here. Engine number one is not running. Air start units away. All the um, all the personnel would be watching us here, making sure everything's okay. One of us, our crazy Canadians, are doing down here at Miramar. Looking back. I'm making sure everything is okay. Really good external walk around here. Making sure uh, that the chalks are removed here. Uh, these chalks are going to be removed here in just a second. Uh, all the panels are done up. Come over here. I'm just going to duck down here. This is done up. So the AC power cart has been removed. Making sure all the panels again are all done up and locked. This is all done, locked. Obviously, this is extremely loud. I'm going to be very, very careful as we come around here. Okay, so in, what we're going to do is walk down this line right here. Underneath the engine, this is going to be very loud. Come down under here, duck. Have a look, make sure everything has been removed from underneath here. No panels are open. All looks really, really good. Uh, the APU is not running, so that's not a big danger. But guess what? That is running. <laughs> so we're going to be very careful. So we're just going to duck underneath here carefully, cross over to the other side, and stand up. Have a look around. Make sure all the all the, everything is all closed here. Everything has been removed. The air start panel is um, closed and we are ready to go okay let's look back here i want to have a look behind the aircraft very carefully nobody's behind us very very important because we're about to run this engine up at high power okay back up into the aircraft here okay let's turn around and get this door closed Okay, the door is coming closed. We're going to lock it. We're going to close this. And now we're going to sit in the seat and get engine number one started. Okay, so now that procedure is completed, we're now at engine start procedure cross bleed. Okay, the first cost and message is when starting engines in close quarters, consideration must be given to the effects of jet blast. We've talked about it in great depth. The procedure requires the use of higher than normal thrust settings on the ground. Ensure that the intake and exhaust areas of the operating engine are secure. The next thing is bleed air, APU, LCV, switch light pressed out. So it should already be in that condition, but we'll make sure APU, LCV is pressed out. It says to, col to, to close load control valve, check APU, LCV, open light is out. So we do not see that light. Okay, bleed air, left or right, tent stage switch light, press in. So 
to open the tent stage SOV for the operating engine. So the operating engine is the right hand side and that was already pressed in. Let's just verify that's bleed air, left or right tent stage switch light press in to open tent stage SOV for operating engine. Check the left and right tent stage closed light out. Okay, we don't have a light. Okay, ICAST page and monitor bleed pressure. So now we've got this set up and most importantly, uh, it, our external safety concerns have been met. So ICAST page is up and we're gonna monitor bleed pressure. To continue on here, the thrust lever of an operating engine, which is again our right hand side, we're gonna to advance to achieve a minimum of 60 PSI. Again, 60 PSI bleed air pressure which is approximately 85% N2. So we are really gonna ramp that engine up. Left or right start switch light press. So once we get that pressure, then we're going to press the number, number one engine's uh, start switch light. We're gonna check for the applicable start light to come on, make sure the ignition comes on, make sure the ignition advisory is on, and make sure that we have a N1 increase. Then, as normal, when we reach 20% RPM and ITT is below 120, we're going to move it to idle. Again, there's another caution message here that talks about if the ITT is not below 120, we have to motor it for the remaining 90 seconds, as we've talked about. Okay, so let's just get up, uh, set up a little bit more here. Engine instruments. We're going to monitor everything, obviously, make sure that we got the 55% disengage at 55% N2. Make sure the ignition goes out after we get everything going. Make sure the ITT is between 450 and 600 with a maximum of 900. The N1 stabilizes and does not go below 22%. And that the oil pressure is above 25%. Okay, so then, if we have an issue, then we have a failure to start procedure, which would follow that. But basically, we're at the point where we can get things going. So in real life and here, I'm going to hold the brakes and we're going to increase the thrust on the right hand engine. Here we go. So we're looking for 85 percent roughly here. But more importantly, we're looking for the bleed pressure to be 60 PSI. We're holding things, things are, it, there's a lot of thrust behind us right now. Really holding those brakes. We're not even near 60 PSI, so let's hold those brakes. Hold, hold, hold. There we go, more, 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 more. Lots and lots of thrust. Bleed pressure's almost at 60. There's 60 PSI, perfect. Okay, clear left, starting left, holding the switch in, light comes on, ignition is on, we need these on, there we go. Okay, there's N2, positive fan, below 120. Fuel flow, ITT, oil pressure's rising, Still holding those brakes big time. Now we're looking for 55% starter cutout. So let's come up top. We got 55% starter cutout. That looks awesome. Gonna come back on that thrust lever. Okay, now we're going to follow the, um, the rest of the procedure here. Thrust lever, uh, first engine to idle, idle speed, verify N2 variation between engines is not within 2%. Per, is within 2 if greater, notify maintenance personnel. Then bleed air, tent stage, left and right switch lights, press in. Okay, so we'll just, we've got two, four, six, and four. They're... They're matched. This is a is an awesome engine start, looking real good. So let's go to the overhead again, 
and make sure that we got everything pressed in. So we're just going to go with kind of an after start at this point. So we've got that pressed in, that's pressed in, and we can turn our packs on now. There we go. I'll disarm this. I can turn this on and I can turn my generator on. Let's come back down to here now. Okay. A couple things that got forgotten there. We'll arm these. Uh, parking brake. Just a good overview here. Now in real life what I'd be doing is once I complete this checklist I would be doing the after start checks and making sure that everything is okay. So hope you've um, enjoyed this um, you know, fairly brief video. I wanted to go over what we would normally do uh, what we, when, we, when we have a no APU operation. The landing is generally not that big of a deal. It's the considerations of needing that extra thrust if you had anti-ice on uh, for the missed approach procedure something that not, not everybody talks about and um, I wanted you to see all of the safety procedures that are involved with getting a uh, an aircraft with no APU operating first with the AC uh, external um, power and the air start cart getting rid of those once we've got engine number two started doing the safety walk around making sure everything is safe and then doing the engine cross bleed start so everything is good. Um, we would complete our checks as required, make sure everything is set up to head over to, um, to Tucson. And that's all I wanted to show you. So thanks very much for seeing um, the engine starting procedure with uh, new APU. Well, I hope you got your tickets ready for Top Gun Maverick. I'm super excited on May 27th. Hope you're able to go check it out. Have a great day. Rob Hammer out.